Databases are one of the fundamental building blocks for cloud-native apps. And with so many types of databases to choose from, it's important to understand their consistency models so that we can make smart choices. But with acronyms such as ACID and BASE, making sense of them can feel like swimming in a big bowl of database soup. Spoiler alert, they have nothing to do with high school chemistry class. In this episode of MobyCast, John and Chris kick off a three-part series where we dive deep on this database soup. In part one, we learn about transaction processing, the ACID acronym, and say hello to strong consistency. Welcome to MobyCast, a show about the techniques and technologies used by the best cloud-native software teams. Each week, your hosts John Christensen and Chris Hickman pick a software concept and dive deep to figure it out. Welcome, Chris. It's another episode of MobyCast. Hey, John. It's good to be back. Yay, good to have you back. Today, we'll skip the jibber-jabber because we got a lot to talk about. We do. <laughs> we are going to talk about uh, something that, if you've listened to MobyCast now for the past 98 episodes, you might have figured that you know programming is mostly just writing code and putting that code in containers and putting, on, putting it on AWS. And then at one point, Chris had a job doing some database stuff, but that we didn't really have to think about databases that much. You know, I think it's time to finally turn our attention towards databases. We're still not going to ever talk about UI, I don't think. So, you know, that doesn't even exist in MobyCast yet, <laughs> and maybe never. Um, but yeah, we, we need to talk a little bit more about databases. They're such a central part of building distributed systems, and I don't think we've given them enough attention here at MobyCast. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I mean, databases and distributed systems in general definitely fundamental building blocks for cloud native apps. I mean, we, whenever you need to store state, it's essentially that's a, that's a database and the, um, the cloud for, you know, first the internet and then the cloud is really driving so much innovation here and, and changes. And it's also kind of exposing, um, just constraints and we have to make trade-offs and that's why there's so many different types of databases now like it used to be like database was a relational database right and that's right. not the case anymore we have like umpteen different types of distinct databases and and so we definitely want to talk about that right and then there may be umpteen in one yeah yes there's probably some lemma that you can um, <laughs> that you can come up with right to prove that but um <laughs> It, and it, so, so we, we, we definitely want to spend some time kind of going through like the survey of, of what's out there in, in the world of databases, especially in regards to, to cloud native apps. But before we do kind of figured, Hey, let's kind of like set some of the ground rules here. Cause there's a lot of three letter acronyms, four letter acronyms, um, terms, yes. buzzwords, like just being thrown around, right? It kind of feels like it's database soup, um, alphabet yeah. soup. So acid, cap, base, like what does all this stuff mean? Um, and right. so I think diving, diving deeper into this, kind of having a fundamental understanding of what these terms mean is really going to provide that foundation as, as we go forward to really make the discussions of the different types of databases and the trade-offs and really kind of the use cases they're going for, it's going to make it much more relevant for us. Right. So Chris, I think the first time I heard the term database, I was maybe in third or fourth grade. Um, and it was my dad that told me that he was making a database and we had an Apple IIe and I was just trying to remember, do you remember what the sort of main database software was for Apple IIe's back then? I think it might have been a Corel, a Corel piece of software or something like that. Do you remember what that was called? Shoot, um, I wish it, I could remember. It might have been HyperCard. Um, no, it wasn't HyperCard. Yeah. I do remember that, but it was yeah. it was like a little... And I remember him telling me, oh yeah, the databases are a place where you put your data. And I was like, okay, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, it has tables. And I was like, no. <laughs> it doesn't have any tables. It's a computer. <laughs> Gee, Dad, so it wasn't it until a lot later that I figured chairs? out. <laughs> it was quite a while before I actually figured out what a database was. But you know, I think that was the same year that I wrote my first code too. So mm -hmm. I just didn't even use databases for a long time after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me. I I always wanted an Apple IIe when I was growing up, but we just that wasn't in the cards for us. I had to get oh. I had to get the knockoff. Oh. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> 
Um, I think the first <laughs> database really kind of I became aware of was just in the PC world. DBase was like the okay. like that was the one that kind of paved the way, right from from a from a PC standpoint. Um, nice, yeah. So that was kind of my first foray into databases. Well, sweet. Um, all right, so let's let's just you know, enough of the you know little kids thinking about databases stuff. Mm-hmm. Let's get into some grown up engineering. Sure. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so we're, we're going to try to make sense here of what acid cap base, what these, these things mean. Um, acid and base are really their consistency models. And we're going to talk more about like exactly what we mean by that. But, you know, first kind of wanted to point out a little bit of a disclaimer as well. Like we're calling this database soup and we're kind of implying that databases are one of these consistency models. Um, but really, more generally, these are really just consistency models for distributed systems in general. Um, mm-hmm. It's just that databases usually form like a big part of a distributed system, and they are the stateful portion of it. So kind of talking about this in context to databases makes a lot of sense as well. But just something to keep in mind that this doesn't just apply to databases, pure, purely databases, right? These are consistency models that can be applied to just systems in general. Yep. Yep. And we're going to apply it to families soon, as you'll see. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I thought we, you know, we, we could talk about the, the, these consistency models, um, kind of think of it as like maybe a three act play, right? Where, Act one, we're going to talk about transaction processing. Um, And this kind of started around, you know, early 70s. And that kind of worked well for for quite some time um, until we get to act two. And and that was kind of really the arrival of the Internet, in particular, the web. And that creates a whole bunch of new challenges for us. And so this is in the late 90s, um, mid to late 90s and into the early 2000s. And that gave rise to the CAP theorem, or at least the ob- the observation of the CAP theorem. So we'll talk about that. And then in the, the last act, Act 3, we'll talk about how eventual consistency as a, as a um, philosophy came along. And in, in a way, it kind of saved the web, right? It allowed us to continue scaling early on. And that led rise to the, the term base systems, um, the acronym base. And so we'll be talking about that. Cool. Yeah. So why don't we kick it off, um, with, um, act one and talk about transaction processing and, and acid. And so, um, you know, really acid, it, it arose from this concept of transaction processing. And so what is transaction processing? process or what what is a transaction right and so and let me interject here that you know listen like especially folks earlier in their career like listen to this part for sure because of you know early in my career transactions it was kind of transactions were king and everybody talked about transactions and beginning and end of transactions and they were so important and now I'm, i feel like sometimes when i interview people they don't really have a sense for what these are and they're so important so here we go right yeah So a transaction, kind of like the the standard definition of it, is just, it's literally, it's a set of one or more operations that produce some sort of state transformation, right? So you're in it, it, and they have exactly once semantics as opposed to maybe once semantics. So it's this series of operations that we can can, um, define as a single unit, and it's either all going to succeed or it's all going to not succeed, right? But there's no intermediate state, right? So that, in general, is kind of like a definition of a transaction. Um, yep. Initially... Uh, let's just put a couple, I mean, let's just put a couple of uh, examples around that. So, you know, a transaction might be that you go to the flea market and you buy a stereo and it's $50, and you hand over $50 and you get a stereo and you walk away. If you were to just hand over fifty dollars and then the transaction failed, like, but the person still had the fifty dollars and you didn't have your stereo, like, that would not be what we would. This that is not an okay transaction. That that's not all right. That's not a transaction. Like, it is for the guy selling the stereo, (laughs) (laughs) right? So, um, you know, the important thing there is like, you either get the stereo and the person gets their fifty bucks, or nobody gets anything. But not, you know, one person gets the stereo and the other person doesn't get fifty bucks, or vice versa. Exactly. Yeah. So there's there's many examples of just in real life where transactions um, 
you know, apply and, and we want that kind of, those kinds of semantics. And so, and then likewise, definitely in computers and, and, um, anytime we're, we're doing transfer state transformations, right. We'd want this. And so and initially transactions. And I did choose like a, a, a type of a, a scenario from the eighties because we are in act one and that's when a lot of it is taking place. Yeah. Nobody's <laughs> buying stereos in 2020 for 50 bucks at a flea market. That is just not happening. Oh, come on. It's retro now, right? It's, it's, it's come back around. It's cool. So maybe they're not buying stereos, but they're buying uh, turntables. <laughs> right. And not on the flea market, but on Etsy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so initially these, you know, transactions, it, these were initially at the, like the machine level, like a single database node, right? So this, this is like business record keeping systems, like kind of gave rise to the need for this. So, you know, you're, tracking financials, right? Or you're doing inventory and things like that, right? So having the ability to do this, these series of operations in a, in a single unit, right? Where it either all succeeds or it all fails was pretty important. As systems became more complicated and we needed to have higher scalability and more concurrency, that kind of evolved to be more like Okay, we need to have transactions not just at a single machine level, but across multiple machines. And so I, it's just kind of, I think it's important to think about like transaction as kind of more of a, a concept and mm-hmm. not this very specific thing, right? It's not just a, it's not just database transaction, right? Where I start, I, I'm like begin transaction, do some operations and then commit, right? That's not the only type of transaction. It could be like, mm-hmm. hey, I need to go update my mailing list with this particular email address. And then after that, I have to send a confirmation message or something like, right. Right. That actually may be a definition of a transaction for you and your system. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of more like where we're going to be at when we're talking about these, these terms is like more at the system level. So just kind of, it's just any kind of series of operations that's producing a state transformation um, that needs to be treated as a, as a cohesive unit of exactly one semantics. That's going to be our definition of transaction. And the process of those obviously is then transaction processing. And so with that, um, you know, early on transactions in order to be um, defined as a transaction, like what exactly does this mean to have exactly one semantics? And so what are the properties that these things should have? And that gave rise to this term ACID, and ACID is an acronym for a set of properties that kind of dictate the required behavior in order to say that, yes, this is a transaction and it has the kind of semantics that we want. So as an acronym, there's four, there's four properties here. So just to name them quickly, we have atomicity, which is kind of a hard word to say, but um, mm-hmm. we got it out. Consistency, isolation, and durability. Right. So um, those are the, the four properties. So let's why don't we go ahead and and dive into these and find out exactly what we mean by them. So we've already made a big deal of atomicity. We have. Right. So let's just kind of reinforce that a little bit. So basically, this is saying like a transaction is guaranteed to be treated as a single unit and it's either going to succeed completely or it's going to fail completely. And so the really you know, big side effect of this or like the, the thing we can count on with this is that it's preventing partial updates to our state or mm-hmm. database, right? Which can, then you, if you have, if you allow partial updates, then you're in an unknown state, right? Like what part succeeded versus, versus didn't. Um, right. So atomicity is that treat as a single unit, either succeed, succeed completely or fail completely. So next is consistency. We're going to talk a lot about consistency today because it's, it's actually overloaded in these some of these terms that we're using. Um, but right now we're talking about consistency from the ACID point of view. And so what this says is this is ensuring that a transaction can only bring the database from one valid state to another. And in particular, it's, it's, main, and it's maintaining any database invariance. So what, so what does this mean, right? So really pure, you can think of this as like, this is just making sure that all any constraints, cascades, triggers, those kinds of rules that are set up on like, what is a valid state for the system? They all have to be maintained and applied. So things like 
referential integrity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that if you have a, a foreign key from one table to another one, when you go and do your update, right? Like that has to, that still has to be valid after doing this, right? So that's consistency from a, from an acid point of view. Okay. The third isolation. So this one's maybe a little bit more difficult to, to wrap our heads around. It's basically says states that the concurrent execution of transactions is going to leave the database in the same state as if executed sequentially, which okay. is kind of, um, again, a little bit weird, but I, I think the way of thinking about this is that when a transaction is happening, it is, for for lack of a better term, you can think of it as being a, in its own bubble that really can't be touched or seen by anything else going on in the system while that's happening. Uh, I was thinking of it a little bit differently. I was thinking of it as like, okay, so if you were to have two operations or two transactions happening at the same time, so they're concurrently happening, then in order for them to be concurrently happening, then they must be talking to different parts of the database. Like, okay, I can update this table over here at the same time as I can do this other table over there that are totally unrelated to one another. But I wouldn't be able to do, um, I wouldn't be able to do transactions like on, you know, that have dependencies on the same table concurrently. Um, because like doing those concurrently versus doing them one after the other would yield different results. So like that would be not allowed by my ACID compliant database. See what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, so that definitely sounds what you're talking about there, John, is, is more like um, using locking as a mechanism for an ACID compliant system to achieve isolation um, where. Yeah, that, that really is what I was getting at. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, just that whole notion of, well, if two things are going to happen at the same time. Um, then they've got to be different enough from one another that it doesn't, they could happen at the same time or one after the other and you end up in the same state. Cause there's definitely stuff that, you know, one thing happening first, then the next thing is going to end up with a different outcome, right? Like one transaction might depend on the outcome of another transaction. So those two obviously could not happen at the same time as one another. Um, and so the database would need to prevent that from happening. If it's acid compliant, yeah, absolutely. Is it, and, and, and at the end of the day, like nothing can happen at the same time, right? So, like if it's if it's the same piece of data that two things want to access concurrently, it's never going to be concurrent, right? Like there needs to be some mechanism in place, and typically it's locking. Um, and so, whoever comes in first will acquire a lock. They'll be able to make their updates, and then they'll release the lock. And now. Meanwhile, the other request was just kind of waiting, right? And it'll actually kind of feel like both of them happened at the same time, but it's always someone gets to go. Someone's going first, right? Only Mm -hmm. one thing can happen. So isolation is basically just saying like, those are the rules, right? You, you can, when, when, when a state transformation is happening, that needs to be isolated so that no one else can see, see, touch, modify, read that partial state while it's happening and the system just needs to guarantee that um, overarching also the consistency comes into play here as well. Right. So you could, yep. you actually could say I, isolation is like, okay, if I'm going in a transaction and I'm updating three different things, as long as I don't show, like let's say I update a, a column value to be 10 and it was 12 and then I go update something else and, and whatnot. As long as I don't show the column value being 12 to someone else, you could say well, that's isolation, um, but mm-hmm. now it may be like if at the same time someone else is changing it to be eight, they see eight, mine see mine sees twelve. That's still isolation, but it's no longer consistent, right? And so right. that violates that that principle. Um, right, right. So they kind of go hand in hand a little bit. Cool. And then what's D for? D D is for durability. Um, so. This one's pretty pretty straightforward, right? So, like, is making sure that the the transaction is durable that it's that once it's been committed, it will remain committed. So, this really comes into play with like what happens in the case of a of a system failure, like a power outage or a crash. Um, guaranteeing like that that is when it, when the system replies back to you that it's been committed that 
it's going to survive even those kinds of those kinds of um, issues, right? So those are the things that asset compliance systems need to be thinking about. Yeah, that's that's also interesting because durability has sort of different levels. There's sort of like the how durable are your disks and things like that. But there's also, I think, from a you know originally in the RDBMS world, durability just meant that if you turn off the database and turn it back on, like your transactions you had before are still this, your database is still in the same state it was. Um, as long as the disks didn't get ruined, right? Yeah, and it's it's just it's it's kind of like that contract that says, "Hey, if database you're going to reply back that my commit of my transaction was complete, that means that you have recorded it in a way such that it will always be committed, right?" Mm-hmm. Um, from a database point of view, so it's like the database could be like, "Hey, I wrote this to disk, right?" and then you could find out that then someone takes a magnet and puts it up next to the hard drive um, and wipes it, and now you don't have your transaction um, anymore. That's not the database fault. The database was right, still durable. Right. It, it enforced durability. It's just that durability wasn't enforced in another part, right? So it's right. definitely a, there's a whole spectrum, right? Of like when we talk about durability. Yeah, and then, well, and that's what's interesting to me is is that the spectrum is is really like there's the sort of RDBMS view of the world, and you know. It's a process on a computer that is like, okay, I, I did my job when the IO system tells me I did my job. But then there's like a distributed system where that transaction might not be considered durable unless it's written to S3, which is 11 nines, right? Like that's what makes it durable. Um, just kind of across multiple, re- you know, like when does it really, when is, are you done with your transaction? And in a distributed system, that answer might be different than it was with just a plain old database running on a single machine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, you know, it could be something as just as simple as like it's been written to a log file and that log file then gets replicated somehow. Or it could mm-hmm, be like, mm-hmm. hey, we're going to be using some other system that gives us um, replication for free across three separate data centers spread spread across a, a, a large geographic region. Um, mm-hmm. And that's part of the part of the solution. But, you know. Each one of these subsystems themselves can be acid, and and right, they, they right. in fact they probably need to be right. So, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you know, yeah, depending like on you the, can't on, have on an the, acid an, a full acid system unless you account for every part that could yeah. not meet the acid compliance test. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So, so that's really what acid is, right? Those four those four properties: atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. So. Pretty straightforward, simple, kind of, you know, at the end of the day, it's like it's a set of operations that are all wrapped up with that are guaranteed by these properties that it's going to make um, it's 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 going to happen as a single unit and as it does a state transformation in your system. We cover a lot of information here on MobyCast, and if you've ever wanted to go back and remind yourself of something we talked about in a previous episode, it can be hard to search through our website and transcripts to find exactly what you're looking for. Well, now it's a lot easier. All you have to do is go to mobycast.fm slash show dash notes and sign up. We'll send you our weekly super detailed outline that we use to actually record the show. And a lot of times, this outline contains more information than we get to during our hour on the air. So sign up and get weekly MobyCast cheat sheets to all of our episodes delivered right to your inbox. So examples of systems with ACID semantics. Um, so obviously, the, you know, the one that is definitely top of mind is our relational database management systems. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. This is really where all this started. It's definitely where it's still... Still, it, it reigns king, right? Could you ma- imagine like a relational system that wasn't acid? Like, it, I mean, obviously, it wouldn't be a relational system, um, right? But like, just, you might not trust your money in there. Yeah, it's just give me, like sometimes primary keys work and sometimes they don't. Like, um, <laughs> yeah. just be really kind of strange. So, there's plenty of relational database management systems out there. Um, you know, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle. SQLite. I mean, there's just you know just tons and tons and tons of systems out there that um, are are acid compliant from from that point of view. It's also kind of interesting to think about like as they go from like single node systems to multi node systems. You know, how do they remain acid compliant? 
as well. Right. So, yeah. Well, and one example of a, a system that has never been asset compliant is rental car reservations. <laughs> 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 I made the reservation. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, unfortunately that was because Seinfeld went with the wrong agency. <laughs> um, you know, it'd be interesting to know, like, how, has this really happened to people? Um, and, and, you know, maybe it's not so much car reservations. Actually, it's what it is. It's, it's when you buy a, um, a, a ticket on an airline. That is not um, acid compliant, right? Oh, because yeah. That's that such happens a great all example. the time. Yes. Like, I yeah, bought yeah, a yeah, ticket yeah, sure. and then you show up at the airport and it's like, we're sorry. We don't have a seat yeah, for you. Yeah, that's such a <laughs> right? good example. We're going to bump you. And it's like, what? Like, and <laughs> they can do that. And they do do that, yeah. right? So, um, uh, you know, that's uh, it's, um, interesting. Even though, sure. the, even though there are real databases tracking those, those seats and th- those databases are acid, the overall system mm-hmm. is not acid. Yeah, I mean, we, we could, it, it, it's, it's an interesting discussion. We could probably go um, on a <laughs> tangent um, and have some personal stories as well. But um, yeah. maybe, maybe we'll just leave it as like the acid um, sem- systems with acid semantics, definitely relational databases, right? Like that's the, the one um, that's just like everyone kind of understands that, knows what it is, knows how it works. Like that is an example of an acid system. Mm-hmm. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting just to talk a little bit about the history um, behind this as well. Um, yeah, let's do it. You know, w- w- just where this came from. And really, like, there's, you know, there's a couple of big players in this space. Um, going back early on, um, Edwin Codd um, was actually the one that kind of like um, basically came up with this, this, this concept of a relational database, right? And, and organizing your data into tables and, and rows and columns. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in, a, in a future episode. But, you know, after that, um, you have uh, folks like Jim Gray. And so Jim Gray is really, I mean, I think kind of consider him like the father of transaction processing. He had a long, very successful, productive career um, and it was actually Jim Gray that came up with the ideas behind ACID back in the, the late 70s. Um, he didn't actually, I don't think he, he didn't actually come up with the term ACID, that acronym. Mm-hmm. Um, that actually happened in 1990, 1983 um, by a colleague named um, Andreas uh, Reuter. And so that's when the acronym ACID was coined. Um, but really it was based upon like, Jim Gray kind of pointing out like, Hey, these are the properties that you need for transaction processing. Um, so, and in addition to acid, Jim Gray also is, is responsible for things like granular database locking, um, two tier transaction commit semantics and a bunch of other stuff. So he, he wrote the Bible, um, in this, in this space called transaction processing concepts and techniques. Um, and, you know, I remember, back when I was really um, studying databases and trying to build a distributed database system. And this was one of the books that was dog-eared on my, on my desk as I was building the system. I was con- re- constantly referring back to this, this book that was written by, by Jim Gray. Um, you don't happen to know if Jim was like an academic or worked in some big company? So I, I th- he's... I think a little bit of a combination. Um, pretty sure, you know, he, he, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he probably got a PhD. I don't know for sure if that's the case. Um, just given, uh-huh. given his career tra- trajectory, I would, uh-huh. since it was so focused in research, I would kind of suspect that he, you know, he did do that, but he spent mo- a lot of the time working in the, in the commercial sector. So he worked at a variety of companies like IBM Tandem Computers, um, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, and then actually in 1995, he was hired by Microsoft, by Microsoft Research, to head up their um, Bay Area Research Center, BARC. Um, and so that was down in the San Francisco um, area. That was the first time, really, that Microsoft kind of set up shop engineering-wise outside of the Redmond, Washington area. And Interesting. Yeah, so that was in 1985 that they hired, you know, Jim Gray, which is, 
it's kind of like a big coup, right? I mean, this like, yeah, like literally like he is like the father of transaction processing, very well known, very well respected, has written, you know, the Bible on this. And here he is, you know, hey, Microsoft, which 1995, like Microsoft's not a powerhouse of research and it's not a powerhouse of, yeah. like, you know, distributed systems even really. Right. No. Like, I mean, remember this is, we're talking windows 95, like NT right. didn't even exist yet. So there really right. wasn't even a server product yet. Um, right. Yeah. So, so he joined there, um, and, and worked at, at, at Microsoft research and then kind of like a, and so he, he, he was a technology fellow there and, um, just continued his research and, and, um, helped out other teams and, 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 uh, I mean, they didn't even have SQL Server, I don't think, at that time. So he was probably working on Access. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, no, I, he he. I, I'm sure if he may have had like um, some consultations with that team, but I, I guarantee you, he probably wasn't. Where I'm sure he would. He was more heads down doing like more researchy type stuff uh-huh. um, than kind of like. A and then maybe writing. also just helping them with their own, yes, you know, yes, databases exactly. that were. IBM database. Yeah, so so consulting and kind of helping mm-hmm. them at, a, at maybe an architecture level type thing or um, whatnot. But, <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, and then kind of in, in a, like a bizarre epilogue. Um, you know, he you know he so he was there starting in 1985 and and was working for Microsoft um, in 2007. And so he 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 was a an accomplished sailor. Um, in 2007, he took a, a he was what was supposed to be a short solo trip by himself on a sailboat out to the Farallon, <laughs> yeah, no, um, out to the Farallon Islands near San Francisco, and he just disappeared, just never came back. Um, and it's it's really just kind of a mis- just a mystery. Um, there was many searches that happened after that. Just never any boat remains are found. They did, um, like I said, various different kinds of searches using like um, satellite data. They did. Um, they kind of crowdsourced this through Mechanical Turk as well, looking at um, satellite images, I think, and whatnot, and just wow. just kind of like literally just disappeared from the face of the earth. Which is just huh. again a really bizarre epilogue. Um, to the to the story, um, and five years later, he was declared legally dead because um, that is the time period five years um, uh, when nobody's found. Where it's like, okay, there's a, you can now be declared legally dead. So, kind of a sad sad ending there. Um, yeah, mysterious ending. Um, very unfortunate. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't, nothing to really add there, but uh, the Falaron Islands, you know, just among surfers are kind of. Famous for just well known for being white sharky. Mm-hmm. Not nobody, nobody's allowed to go there though. It's just something that everybody happens to know about. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. Do you know how far away it is from San Francisco? I mean, it's not that far. It can't be more than like 20 miles because you can see them when it's really clear, okay. and you know, curvature of the Earth would prevent you from seeing much beyond that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, another care, uh, another player I just wanted to talk about briefly is Philip Bernstein. And so he was another big player in the field of transaction processing. Um, likewise, he also joined the Microsoft research team in, I think it was in the mid nineties. Um, he came there from after working at deck, um, as well. So digital equipment corporation. And he wrote a book called the principles of transaction processing in 1997, and this was a very popular, very popular, important book on transaction processing that kind of um, uh, perhaps made the material that was in Jim Gray's book a bit more um, reachable, if you will. Um, so I think Jim Gray's book is almost a thousand pages long versus um, Phil's book is, you know, maybe a couple hundred pages um, type thing uh-huh. and, and kind of a bit more um uh, practical, right. With kind of like real world examples of various different systems and whatnot. But, um, definitely. And again, one of those books that was really important to me, um, I had my copy and referred to it frequently as I was, you know, 
building this distributed database type system. And then kind of like an interesting fun fact is I actually got to meet Phil. Um, and this was back like probably 1980, maybe near the end of 1989 or, or early 2000. I don't remember the exact date. Right. And, and as we go into this fun fact, like, I don't know that everybody that's started listening, I mean, all the hordes that have started listening to MobyCast recently have gone back and listened to the episode where you talk about, um, you know, your foray into building a database. Uh, so do that. It's so fun. It's such a good story. The, we didn't have Roy England with us at the time, so the sound quality is not as good, but, um, doesn't matter when, the, when the story is good, you can, you can handle listening to a Google meet recording. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think those were episodes 39 through 43. Um, and so that was um, kind of a recounting of just, we call, I think we called it the birth of NoSQL, but it was really like, you know, this is back in the, the late 90s. Um, I had been at Microsoft and we had this issue of like the pain point of like, how do you scale the database Layer. It was really easy to scale the, the front end web servers and even application servers, but the things with state database was like something that was like we didn't have a really good answer for. So we were always scrambling trying to figure out how to scale the data. And that kind of led to me leaving Microsoft and, and co founding a company, a VC funded company, to go build a scalable internet database system. Mm-hmm. Um, and a wild ride. We ended up raising. $24 million in VC and um, uh, built some very, very, very cool technology, um, uh, a few patents around that as well that were then kind of referenced by other folks like like Amazon. Um, and so, but it, it, what we were building there was definitely an ACID compliant distributed system, right? Like we were definitely at that point still trying to build something with 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 very strict consistency. Um, yes. So, you know, this is the you know during this time I'm I'm building this. I'm referring to these books as well, like to help me out. Um, our investors, um, which were based here in the Seattle area, um, they were also close with um, both UW the UW Computer Science Department, and then also some of the you know the. Um, the bigger company, so so Microsoft as well, and so it just turns out that um, you know Madrona, which is the name of our in, our our VC investors, they were talking with with Phil Bernstein. Um, he was kind of doing some, I think, some consulting for them or, or whatnot. And uh, just one day, one of our investors just say, "Oh, you know, hey, you you want to meet Phil Bernstein?" And I was just like, "What?" <laughs> Are you mm-hmm. you kidding me? Like this is the guy that wrote this book that I this dog eared book that I've been referring to. Um, like I can meet this guy, and so I ended up I I got a chance to sit down with him, you know, one on one. And you know, I I forget like you know how long it. I mean, it was probably like forty five minutes or an hour, but it was like it was just. I just remember thinking like, wow, this is really pretty cool, pretty special. Um, that you know, like. I can't believe I'm meeting this guy. Um, and I get to talk to him about building, you know, building this, this system that is enforcing transaction processing um, and kind of hearing his thoughts on it. So it was, it was pretty neat. That is cool. It, it definitely makes me think though, that the people that introduced you to him, you know, are probably out buying islands and he m- maybe, maybe isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so Phil actually is still at Microsoft Research. So, okay. um, long, long career. Um, he's still there. Obviously, must be happy. Um, he continues to do novel new work. Um, it's not all just transaction processing anymore, obviously. Um, you know, things have changed quite a bit, and there's lots of interesting problems to go chase. So, I think he's still publishing papers. He's still doing research. Cool. He's still there. Cool. Um, and, he may not be buying islands, but he's, 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 he's doing okay. Yeah. yeah. What if you had X amount of shares of Microsoft's stock from 1998? You'd mm-hmm. be doing pretty well. Yep. Indeed. Yes. So that is, um, that concludes, I think, act one um, of, of, our, of our journey here. So we've gone through like just what is ACID, what does it mean, and some of the history behind it. Um, kind of feels like that might be a good place to stop. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that we, you know, 
Act two is the cap theorem. And I don't think act two is going to take a whole episode. I think it'll be quicker. And then act three. So act two and three we can do next week. Sounds good. All right. Well, that was really fun and fascinating. And finally, we're storing some data instead of just moving um, bits around inside containers. So I appreciate it, Chris. Serverless. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Talk to you next week. All right. Thanks, John. Bye. Bye. Thanks for being aboard with us on this week's episode of MobyCast. Also, thanks to our producer, Roy England, and I'm our announcer, Stevie Rose. Come talk to us on MobyCast.fm or on Reddit at r slash MobyCast. 